everybody to another installment of this we're gonna call it a wonderful podcast because it's beautiful we love it here because we're the only ones here and no one else is denying we can't hear your judgment so don't even try actually if you want to reach out i do have a twitter handle what is it i actually i don't know i haven't I don't know. Gonna, I don't even have a picture on Twitter. <laughs> we're going to have to figure this out at some point. MySpace.com slash Danielle. Oh, we should we should get a MySpace. We, we could single-handedly bring MySpace back. Now you heard it here first, folks. Uh, MySpace.com slash Things123. Anyway, this week we're talking about mattresses. Neat. What about them? Well, I meant to... I meant to make the announcement on the last on last week's episode that we were going to be talking about mattresses because I wanted to I wanted to let the people know what the next coming up episode would be about at the end of the previous episode. Well, I definitely won't forget to edit something in in the last episode that says what we're going to talk about in the next episode. Right, I forgot about magic. Yes, I will not forget how to do my magic. Okay. Well, wee, 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 wee. All right, it's in there. <laughs> okay. It's that easy. Few people will tell you. Mattresses. What's their whole deal? Well, their whole deal is that we've been using them a long time. Like a long time. Have we? Yeah, like since the beginning of sleep. That, I have to imagine, would be the beginning of time itself. <laughs> um, Actually, they didn't really, really start until fire. Because the ground is now safe. We may sleep upon it. Is that how we discovered fire? fire? Somebody set their mattress up and woke up to a bad time? No. I mean, I don't know. I don't know the origins of fire. I just know that once we had fire, we were like, hey, we should really start sleeping down here instead of in these trees. (laughs) Anyway, so the English word for mattress comes from a combination of the Arabic word matare and the French word matteris. Matteris. Or if, like, if, you know, if you want to say it French, just matteris. You just have to say it kind of sing-songy and it's, it's French. Is that how French works? No. <laughs> oh. No, not at all. I thought I just learned a new language. <laughs> nope, not at all. <laughs> I am going to the store. No, it's like was Beauty, that French? It's Beauty and the Beast. How's that? Well, because cause that was French. It's a French story. Oh. So they were speaking French that whole movie and I understood them? It's the power of Disney, man. Wow, they really are good. (laughs) So these two words came together most likely in the 11th century during the Crusades, which I don't I don't know anything about the Crusades. Do you know anything about the Crusades? As far as I know, uh, the Christians went and murdered everybody because they weren't Christian. Sounds. (laughs) Sounds. Am I getting that right? (laughs) I don't know. I'm not going to comment on that. (laughs) But yeah, sure. The root of mattresses, like I said, is is the invention of fire. We now do not have to sleep in these trees. We can make something on the ground and sleep there instead and not worry about falling out and on our bunk at our heads. No more trees for me. I'm a big shot now. I get to lay on, on the, the ground. Get to lay on the ground, but get this. I don't even notice the rocks anymore. I've got a mattress. Not yet. Not yet you don't. Right now you have some sticks and leaves. Oh. So we discovered a mattress from 77,000 years ago. Um, it was in a rock shelter located in Sibudu, Sibudu, South Africa. It was in a cave. And it was made of various types of grasses and leaves. And some of these were actually like insect propellant. They, they figured that out. They're like, hey, this one makes the mosquitoes not bite me so much. Look at them go. How clever. <laughs> yeah. Um, it was, I saw a picture of it. It's kind of hard to explain. It was 15 layers within a chunk of sediment that was like 10 feet thick. So, wait, what? So they went into this cave and they saw like a 10 foot tall stack of dirt? No, it's like under the ground. So they they dug dug, a hole It was was an archaeological dig and there was 15 layers of leaves and things all stuck together 
yeah, okay, I strongly suggest everyone go and look at this picture because it's really hard to explain. Okay. Sounds cozy, though. 15 layers. Got that 15-ply mattress. Mm-hmm. That's nice. That, oh, by the way, 10 feet is 3 meters for our one German listener that I know of. <laughs> Great. You're welcome. So between 3000 and 1000 BCE, we began to see elevated sleeping surfaces for protection against snakes and rodents and creepy crawly things. Except for bed bugs who love elevated surfaces. Posts. They love posts. Yeah, fun fact for the, for the listeners. Bed bugs, they're attracted to uh, tall objects. Sleeping, what, what are they called? Bed posts. Yeah, yeah. They love them. Mm-hmm. They see those bad boys across the room and they know they're eating good tonight. Ugh. So early Romans um, elevated their mattresses so much that they needed ladders. Seems excessive. I think it was a a pride thing. Like, oh, my bed is so tall. I need a ladder. Mr. Big Shot's got his mattress all the way up to the ceiling. Uh, They were made of wood or metal or ivory and supported by ropes and string. Like to keep the mattress from sagging down. And they were stuffed with wool or feathers. And then for the poorer people, it was more likely hay or straw. Sounds pretty nice. I like hay. Pretty soft. A little scratchy. Sounds terrible. I dare you. I dare you to sleep one night on a hay bed. I'm willing to bet that I have at one point slept in hay. I have. We used to stay in... We used to sleep in our barn all the time. That's... No, it's sad. <laughs> well, we did it on purpose. It was for fun. We had like a hay room and we slept on the hay with like blankets. Good for you, as it long was, as you had fun. It was very scratchy. It was not great. I mean, it was fun because it was something different, but it wasn't. I assume. A good time. I assume they wrapped the hay in something. Yeah, um, linen, just wool, anything, anything that they could sew up, pillowcase looking thing. Probably makes it a lot better. Probably. So you're not. I mean, it's still gonna. It's still gonna poke through. Mm. Not like a sweet down mattress. Mm, no. Have you ever had feathers, feather pillows? Oh, those, they poke they too. They poke too. Mm-hmm. All these things are pokey. Mm-hmm. So Greeks of ancient times slept in a similar slept on a similar mattress, um, but with an emphasis on comfort. They had a thing called clines. And they appear more like modern sofa or day beds with a raised headboard. They to me they look more like chase lounges. Oh, and they slept on those? Mm-hmm. Wealthy Greeks had multiple clients for separate uses. Like this is my napping client. Ooh. This is my My love making client. Oh gross. They were decorated with lavish upholstery and like materials. They were they were very sleek. Luxurious. Especially for the time. The Greeks, man. They were all about they were all about art and culture and comfort. And them Romans they just wanted to sleep as close to the ceiling as possible. Different strokes. So Persia it, it's unclear whether Persia actually developed the first waterbed around three thousand six hundred BCE, but we'll give it to them. Why not? The waterbed? Yeah, the waterbed. How did that work? So they filled sewn together goat skins and they they filled it with water and then they laid it out in the sun to warm during the day. Then they moved it back inside for sleeping. So that's what waterbeds are for. You're supposed to take them out in, in, in the day. You're completely glazing over. They took goat skins. And then they filled it with water, and then they heated it up in the sun. What could that have smelled like? Well, I imagine it was a, like a leather, right? Surely they didn't use like a male goat. You know male goats have that smell? Oh, oh no, my mattress is all musty. <laughs> but it seems that these were mostly used for um, sick and elderly people. This wasn't like, oh, every family, you know, you pull out your water bed and you put it out in the sun. So just old man Jenkins pulling out his waterbed, letting it rest in the sun a while. I, I maybe some to soothe them, his old bones. Hopefully somebody helped him pull it out. I mean, water's kind of heavy. Also, like, how many goats did they have to sew together to make a bed? 
I'm going to say s- <laughs> 12. That's a lot of goats. I was going to say like maybe four. Well, I guess their their mattresses probably weren't very big. Probably just to fit one person. No, it's just so. one person, one long goat tube. Yeah, maybe like six goats. One one long water filled goat tube. Six goats for a twin. Twelve goats for a queen. I don't think I don't think they. You gotta remember they were moving this thing outside and inside all the time. I wonder how they moved it. Did they just drag it on the ground? <laughs> the logistics of this process. If I could go back to any point in time, I want to go back and watch old man Jenkins warm his goat bed. Ew. <laughs> warm his goat bed. So Eastern cultures. Let's, let's move away from, from Persia and their goat beds. All right, I'll, I'll try to put it in the back of my mind for now. The Eastern world continued to sleep in mattresses placed on the floor and but Japan, they had bedrolls. They they preferred simplicity, the Japanese. And so not just for style, but they were also convenient for small homes and they were easy to store away. They were usually stuffed with cotton. Yeah, I was under the impression they they kind of slept on the floor for a while basically. Is that right? Sure. I don't know. I mean, a bedroll kind of sounds like basically sleeping on the floor. I feel like I do remember someone telling me that but i don't know if that was true that they slept on like wooden planks i don't know sounds good for the spine the chinese had cotton bed rolls as well but they placed them high high up in the 11th century bce they developed the kong uh, uh, it was a larger elevated bed system that is made from brick or clay and the advantage of this bed is that it can be heated so they had like a a had, stove top that they put a bedroll on. Yes, and then they heated it up. That sounds kind of nice. It kinda, it, to me, it kind of looked like a clay throne. Good for them. That's cozy. India, Pakistan, and Bangladesh. They had carpoy. Charpoy? I don't know. Tell me about that. Uh, it was a, a type of rope bed that is simple um, in construction, but aesthetically more elaborate. Depending on the fibers and the weave design, it was also easy to transport from home to home. Basically, it was a hammock. Very cool. They were hanging loose. Well, that term makes a lot more sense when you apply it to hammocks. Okay. The Renaissance period. The mattresses themselves didn't change much at the time, but the ornate detail of the bed frames became incredibly elaborate. Up until now, mattresses were kind of single-sized. Now they are... Gaining size and multiple occupants. Because nice. the Renaissance. All right. Uh, curtains were added to keep drafts and pests out and extra privacy because, like, there were multiple people staying in All the same right. bedrooms. And there were trundle beds now that, again, was to pump up those numbers of how many people could sleep in one room. Get them all in there, buddy. Go for it. Let's move to the modern era. By the 19th century, elaborate uh, statement beds fell out of fashion with practicality in mind. Box springs were introduced to, the re- to, the, to reduce motion and prevent lumps and sagging. So we weren't sleeping on the ceiling anymore. No, we, we've decided that lower to the ground, like getting into the bed should start at the floor. That's lame. Uh, No more ladders. This younger generation doesn't know anything about having nice things. The industrial age booming meant metal frames became more common over wooden. And by the 20th century, mattresses were mass-produced, meaning comfortable mattresses for all, regardless of your class. Cutting-edge technology. Look at how far we've come. So that's kind of the history of where we came from and where we are now. I have um, some more specific information about well, the, the modern mattress. Hit me with it. Tell me about mattresses. What's their deal? Heinrich Vespel. He's, he, he, he's fun to say. He's who we're starting with. What, we, uh, what about it? This is when mattresses finally have a big change. The Inner Spring Mattress by Heinrich Vespel. He invented the inner spring mattress in 1871 in Germany. And unfortunately, he never earned much recognition or money, and he spent his days in poverty. 
It took more than 60 years for his creation to actually become accepted among people. The man who invented the, the modern spring mattress was doomed to spend the rest of his days sleeping on a hay bag. Yep. Well, maybe he had. He probably was sleeping good, but the rest of his people. You think he made his own and he was like, yeah, nobody else can have it. I know. I don't think so. I, 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 I imagine that he probably tried to get people on board. But you know how difficult it is to get people to do anything. No, we sleep on feathers, and we're going to continue to sleep on feathers. I'm going to keep grabbing these gooses. You can't give me your splintery toilet paper. Yeah, see? It's just it's two great examples of people just not wanting to let go. By the 1900s, pocket coils were invented. A Canadian by the name of James Marshall gave a, gave Canadians, they... They, they always give us the best stuff. Saw that commercial with Dave Grohl. You know what he was talking about. <laughs> uh, they were pre-compressed coils that were individually encased and sewn into a fabric pocket. Basically, the first form-fitting mattress. Because it, it, like each, each pocket moved. So oh, they weren't connected. Okay. They were all kind of sewn individually, which meant that your butt could be lower than your back. Do you think he did like memory foam demonstrations where he put a glass of wine on it and then he jumped on it and he was like, see how the glass of wine still spills everywhere? It would have spilled a lot more if it didn't have these springs. I don't think they had commercials back I, then. Well, he could have done a public demonstration. Okay, they definitely did those. You know, he drags yeah. his mattress to the middle of town square and he jumps on it. And he's like, look at me. He established the Marshall Mattress Company, operated under Marshall Sanitary Mattress Company, until the 1930s, with a name change to Six Spring, and continues for 119 years, then sold Flex Group in 20, 2019. Six Spring? Six Spring, mm-hmm. Did it only have six springs? The picture I saw had a lot of springs, so I don't know where this name came come from. What a madman. John Dunlop now comes the invention of latex foam. In the 1920s, it's, it's a little sketchy on whether it's 20, 1920 or 1928, uh, John Dunlop was born in Scotland and invented the first inflatable tire for his son's tricycle. And he, he tries to patent it on December 7th, 1888, and two years later it is called out for being invalid because someone had already patented the same thing in 1846 in France, and then he died. An inflatable tire? Mm-hmm. So he, he thought he created the inflatable tire, but somebody else did it first. Yeah. And then he died. <laughs> it was latex, latex foam. We're going into the direction of latex foam. E.A. Murphy worked at Dunlop Development Laboratories, and he must have gotten bored one day and put the latex rubber in a kitchen mixer and invented latex foam. And his co-workers kind of made fun of him until they realized how incredible this invention would be. Is that memory foam? Not that yet. Not quite? Not yet. We're getting there. Is that that fun, squishy foam? It's really fun to squeeze? Uh-huh. That they make all the it, It's downfall stress balls is out of. That, that it melts in the heat, melts in very hot temperatures, and then it shatters in the cold. Oh. Yeah, so it wasn't. Not great for tires, that's for sure. No. Charles Yost. Do you recognize this name? No. No? Never heard it. Charles Yost worked with the design team for NASA during the prep for the moon landing. Ooh, fancy. The engineers were working on making takeoff more comfortable for the astronauts. Individually molded seats were comfortable but not practical for changing bodies. You know, like this seat was made for John. And now this seat will only hold John's butt. During the development, he put gas into polymeric matter to make temper foam or TP foam. It eventually distributed weight and sprang back to its original shape. Evenly distributed weight. So, so you're saying that this magical foam, this mystery material, could remember its shape? Are you trying to bring us around to memory foam? Is it memory foam? Yes. Yes, it's memory foam. <laughs> I know I'd get it one of these times. So NASA then released the rights to memory foam in 1980s, but it was expensive and it was challenging to reproduce. However, that did not deter Swedish Phaedra de la World Foams. 
one of the first companies to work with the product, and released the Tempur-Pedic in 1992. I know those guys. Mm-hmm. It was difficult to work with in the 90s. It was hot, and it didn't allow the sleeper any, like, breathing. It was, it was sweaty. In 2006, cooling gels was implemented to help it be a cooler experience, and uh, memory foam evolves today with added material including aloe vera green tea extract and activated charcoal to reduce odor does activated charcoal do anything if you swallow poison and you take activated charcoal absolutely it will absorb the poison and then you will not die as far as it like making your teeth whiter or helping with odors i don't think so <laughs> seems kind of like a modern snake i'm oil. pretty sure it only has one use and that is if you drink cyanide please find some activated charcoal really fast we need to we need to make sure we buy all those activated charcoal toothpastes and 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 whatnot so we can have some around just in case i don't even know if i don't know if that would be the same thing because like it's powder and it has a lot of surface area. So you need the absorbency. I don't think you can just eat charcoal toothpaste and it do the same thing. I'm pretty sure you have to have powder, activated charcoal. We had it at the clinic, but... Well, that's not going to stop me from eating my toothpaste, so it nice try. It should. Nice try, pal. Okay. Rayon is another recent addition, and it use, it, it's used in mattresses to wick away moisture. Rayon? Help, yeah, it would help with the with the sweats. What is rayon? Isn't that a gas? Or am I thinking of radon? I'm pretty sure you're thinking of radon. <laughs> Gonna have to figure this one out before I go into my own mattress making business. So Dr. Neil Arnott, Arnott, Dr. Neil brought the waterbed back in the 1800s as the hydrostatic bed for invalids. This was the return of the waterbed. The what? The hydrostatic bed for invalids. Again, it was for old and sick people. Because water beds are so comfortable and good for you. Yes. Okay. Because water beds are so comfortable. I mean, at the time, it was 1800s. You had hay and wool and water and goats. <laughs> and goats. The modern water bed was created by Charles Hall in 1968. And he started out wanting to make a chair prototype made of vinyl stuffed with 300 pounds of cornstarch. And he abandoned that project real fast and he Good. set out to make the water, the more modern waterbed. A chair full of 300 pounds of cornstarch? Yes. I can't say I'm sad that he abandoned that project. <laughs> He was granted a patent in 1971, which was originally called Liquid Support for Human Bodies. Catchy. Mm -hmm. I like the way it rolls off the tongue. Liquid Support for Human Bodies. Uh, band name. In 1978, sales peaked at 22% of the, of the domestic mattress industry. A big factor to the influx of the waterbed sale is contributed to sexually associated advertising. Woohoo! Yeah, Hall, Hall is even quoted admitting to that. Feel the motion of the ocean, baby. What's oh. up? Water beds were supposed to be very sexy. They were no longer for the sick and elderly. They were for the virile and ready to mingle. Henry Petrosky, not only was, this is a quote from him, not only was it the cool new gadget, but it, it emerged during a time when the culture embraced anything different, especially a product that embodied sexual liberation. It was a very sexy time. Mm. The the sexual freedom. The 70s, mm-hmm. Uh, Hall's patent went to trial, though, in 1991 for infringement. Somebody else already made a waterbed. Several people had made a waterbed, but no one else made it sexy. They were just mad at him because he was the first one who thought about not using goats. I'm sensing a trend of animal abuse in this podcast. Peter's going to have a field day with us. Well, there, you're going to sense a trend of animal abuse in human history. That's why we treat our animals great now, to make up for all the times that we disembodied them and shoved them full of water and used their necks to wipe our butts. Sorry, goats and geese. And whatever's next. So let's talk about the history of bed sizes. They have some fun quips. Um, the majority of Americans slept on twin-size mattresses, and salesmen were encouraged to sell two twins. 
two families because sex was bad. Ah, yes. A husband and wife should never lay together. No, That's no. Disgusting. They should have two very cute separate beds with a little table in the middle. And then, you know, if you want to do it, then you just have to... Go somewhere else, you filthy perverts. Some full-size beds were in circulation, but it wasn't until 1950s that they began marketing the different mattress sizes under king and queen. And this was to appeal to people's vanity, like the keeping up with the Joneses mentality. Oh, I have a, I have a queen-size bed, and then the next person comes along, and they're like, oh, I have a king-size bed, and it only gets crazier from here. <laughs> I should be sleeping on a king-size bed, as I am the king of my cul-de-sac. Thank you very much. They gained popularity through the 1960s, but marketing wasn't the only factor. Research shows at the time, in, in, in early 1900s, only 4% of men were 6 feet or taller. And by the 1960s, 20% of men were 6 foot or taller. So the beds getting bigger was not only just marketing, it was also a necessity. So we have been getting taller. Mm-hmm. That's why my feet always hang off the beds. I'm not a freak. And data showed the same for women, but I could not find any numbers. Men have been getting taller and also women too. Eh, classic history for you. Yeah, they were like, yeah, it's happening to women too, but we don't really care how tall they are. As long as they're not taller than me. They, uh, of course, you had, to, you had to get bigger beds because people were getting bigger. So this is when we start seeing the Wyoming King, which is 84 inches by 84 inches. The Wyoming King. The Wyoming King. And then Where did we... they get these names? From? I've heard of I've heard of the Alaskan King. I've not heard of the Wyoming King. We have the Wyoming King, the Texas King, the Alberta King, the Extra Wide King, the Alaskan King, Super Wide King, and Family Bed. Family Bed. Family Bed. It's 144 inches by 80 inches. Finally, a bed big enough for my whole family of mistresses. That is not. That, no, this is not a sister wife bed. Is this that is, not what they intended? No, like they like, could have just called it the Utah bed. Ben. No, it's for <laughs> it's for families. It's for your significant other and your children. It's for, it's for you and your SO but and your many, many younglings. Do you think anybody used it for that purpose? I hope they did. This isn't the Renaissance. <laughs> what, what, what decade are we in right now? We're, we're, most, we're in the 1900s. Mm. This was very frowned upon. You did not have multiple wives unless you lived in Utah. There you have it, the Utah king, folks. <laughs> that is not on my list. There is not a single Utah king, although there might be now. We're going to TM that. The Utah Utah king TM pending. Uh, So let's talk about the future of mattresses. You'd think that there's nowhere else we could go, right? We sleep on it. It's comfortable. Where? What more could we possibly ask from a mattress? The secret to where mattresses is going is you. The mattress, yes, the mattress is starting to monitor the person occupying it we've got sleep quality heartbeat respiratory rhythm movements body temperature sleep duration data relating to the room like the temperature the room the the mattress temperature the room temperature the room brightness noise level ideal positioning adjusting softness and firmness from one side of the bed to the other now i've never used any mattress that is smart enough to read my temperature and heartbeat and breathing rhythm and the room temperature and the bed temperature, but this all seems like a lot. I mean, okay, so if we're going to have smart fridges and smartphones and smart TVs, we might as well just go ahead and make the whole house smart and have a smart mattress, and then you can just tell your phone and say, hey, I'm about to go to bed. In fact, I don't even have to tell them that I'm about to go to bed. They know I'm about to go to bed. They know I'm about to go get some sweet Z's on and they're going to adjust the temperature of the mattress and the room and they're going to have my favorite sleeping show already going. It's going to be great. I guess I've never felt compelled to tweet from my fridge before, but Samsung, if you can let me tweet from my bed, we've got something going on here. I think 90% of tweets are either from toilets or beds. But what if I forget my phone on the toilet? (laughs) Gosh darn it, I can't transfer this tweet. I started it on my toilet, and now I'm in my bed. Okay, Samsung smart bed, finish that tweet. 
Uh, the last, the last thing that I have uh, is the ease of purchase. Have you heard of a bed in a box? Is that like Casper and Purple the online mattress? Yeah, dear, we have a bed in a box. I mean, oh, it's not in a box anymore. Now it's on our box spring, but that's good. But we had a bed in a box, and 27% of mattress buying happened online in 2016, and that jumped to 47% in 2020. Can you guess why? Pandemic? Yeah. Not only is it easier to just buy, and it's also not an incredibly expensive thing. You're talking about like $500. And that's not to say that $500 isn't a lot. I'm just comparing it to like a car trying to buy a car online you're talking thousands of dollars this is this is a smaller investment that you're not seeing before you're getting and you know reviews usually usually we were happy with ours and also we're all scared to go to those mattress stores because we're all just a little bit sure that they're owned and operated by the cartel oh public service announcement you should change your mattress every i think it was seven to ten years eight to ten years why convince me well it will lose its shape and also you can't wash them and sheets only do so much this sounds like just more of that mattress salesman bullcrap with like that time you tried to convince me that i need to change my sheets at least once a year bull no okay Let's let's review that too while we're at it. You should be changing and washing your sheets at least once a week. So make a routine every Saturday. Strip that bed. Make a compelling argument why. Because you're gross when you sleep. You get sweaty and you drool and then that gets all over your pillow and your mattress and these things, they need to be replaced. Also, because I'm not actually against changing your sheets, uh, bed bugs... Bed bugs like it when you don't wash your sheets. That's the thing. Look it up. Is that all you got to say? Mm, uh, next week. What are we talking about next week? Bottled water. Bottled water. Yeah. I think we need to get away from things that take so long to talk about. Like things that we've been doing forever since the beginning, like pooping and sleeping. We need to move to something that's more current. You trying to tell me that cave people didn't have bottled water? They definitely didn't have plastic bottled water. They might have, like, Well, now you're just it. being insulting to cave people, and I don't appreciate it. So, yeah, bottled water next week. Thanks for listening to this week's episode. I'm Ben. And I'm Danielle. Don't forget to grab a goose and sun your goats. Are we going to keep adding to this? Is this just going to get longer with each <laughs> podcast? Well, obviously, I'm going to remind people to sun their goats. They don't want to sleep cold. Mm-hmm. Sun your goats, people. Okay. Okay. This needs to stop. This needs to stop. Nah. Go! Forgive me, but-